you very much. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be here today and able to talk about the teachings of St. John Paul II regarding conjugal, conjugal love. These are very important teachings, and I think they can provide a, a sure foundation for all that we'll be studying and for all our deliberations over the course of this symposium. If I might start on a personal note, uh, I, I'd like to record my thanks to three of the many great theologians who've been associated with the ITI, of which I'm so proud to be a board member. I mean, first of all, I'm delighted that Father John Sayward is here with us today. Father Sayward has been a huge influence on, on my life over many years, and it was he who first introduced me to the ITI back in 2001 and, and rekindled in me a, a love and a passion for the study of theology. I owe a great deal to him, and, and so does, does this institute, and it's wonderful to have you with us here again, to Father. I'd also like to record my thanks to Mikhail Volstein, who's, who's not with us today, but, but who is a very important person too in my life and in the life of this institute. Of course, he was our first president. And it was Mikhail who really first inspired in me a love for the study of the writings of St. John Paul II. Um, Mikhail, long before anybody had ever heard of an iPhone, had an extraordinary primitive handheld device on which he astonished me by showing me that he had recorded every single encyclical of St. John Paul II. And we had the great privilege of attending the, the funeral of St. John Paul II together uh, in 2005. And uh, we, we started off with quite some adventures with, some, with two tickets which for very special seats which Mikhail had obtained from the most unimpeachable sources but which turned out to be forgeries. <laughs> and so after some struggle, we, we managed to get a position somewhere in the piazza. And as we, as we waited for the ceremonies to begin, we were able to read the, from the encyclicals of John Paul II on this primitive device, which was a wonderful experience. Um, so uh, again, Mikhail, very sorely missed here and achieved a, a, an immense amount here. And it's great to have, have his son, Father Edmund, with us here. And finally, let me thank Cardinal Schoenburn, who, of course, is not with us today, but will be back tomorrow, um, especially for all of the wise things that he's taught me over the years and for the extraordinary fatherly care and love that he's shown for this institute. For, for, to all the three of these and to all of our dedicated and, and, and wonderful teachers, I, I'd like to give my thanks on behalf of the board. Now, I personally never met John Paul II. I'm sure many people here did. But I did have a life-changing experience in the first year of his pontificate when I was a young student, at, uh, then a history student at Cambridge University, uh, when I attended the Angelus uh, at Castle Gandolfo. And that was a profoundly moving experience, and I think one of the first steps for me in the journey that I took from Anglicanism to the Catholic Church uh, and this was a journey that I completed four years later when I was received into the church in 1982. So for the first 23 years of my life as a Catholic, I knew of no other pope than St. John Paul II. And when it was clear in 2005 that he was dying, I really found it hard to imagine living in a church without him. Today, when I read his writings, I'm always struck not only by how extraordinarily profound they were and how full of truth they were, but how prophetic and providential they were. You can see this prophetic nature of his writings in the tireless insistence on the unique dignity of every human being and in his refutation of those false totalitarian systems which denied that dignity and denied, sought to deny God's presence in human life. And of course, his writings were not only a prediction of, but did a huge amount to bring about the very fall of those totalitarian systems. You see again how providential and how prophetic he was in that moving encyclical, Salvificio Dolores, which he wrote, which speaks of the salvific power of human suffering, something of which he himself was to become almost a living icon in his latter years. Uh, and which, of course, the suffering church throughout the world today uh, is bearing witness to. And, of course, most of all for our purposes today, I think you see a very prophetic and, and profoundly 
providential set of teachings in everything he taught about human sexuality and about conjugal love. It's to that topic that I would now like to turn. Long before the sexual revolution of the 1960s plunged the Western world into a kind of moral confusion, the young Karol Wojtyla was developing the Christian doctrine of conjugal love in a way which could make it intelligible to, to modern man. In that touchingly human book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, St. John Paul II said, as a young priest, I learned to love human love. It was to become a fundamental theme of my priesthood. Well, of course, it was not only a fundamental theme of his priesthood, it was a fundamental theme of his writings. And uh, the, as, as Mikhail Volstein tells us in that magisterial introduction that he wrote to St. John Paul's Theology of the Body, he says the theme of man's being created in God's image and the conjugal meaning of the body runs like a deeply embedded watermark through all the writings of St. John Paul II from his doctoral thesis, Faith According to St. John of the Cross, to his final encyclical, Ecclesia de Eucharistia. By restating the, the traditional Catholic doctrine about sexuality, which elevated it to a place of supreme anthropological importance based upon its essence of mutual gift of man to woman and mutual submission of man to woman, I believe that St. John Paul gave to the church all of the tools that she needs to address the anxieties and confusions of modern man about, about human sexuality. I'd like to look at some of these teachings first and then to go on to explore how they anticipate and I think stand to refute some of the errors which have, I believe, expressed, been expressed during the recent synod on, in some voices. The fundamental point of departure for St. John Paul's teaching about conjugal love is the dual insight of Gaudium et Space 24.3. The first part of that is the paradoxical teaching that man can only find himself through a sincere gift of self. Even before the Second Vatican Council had enunciated this truth, the young Karol Wojtyla had been, had been working it out in his early work, Love and Responsibility. There he writes this, the decisive character of spousal love is the giving of one's own person to another. The fullest, the most uncompromising form of love consists precisely in self-giving, in making one's inalienable and non-transferable eye someone else's property. And Mikhail Wolstein has shown that he developed this out of a perfect inverse application of St. John of the Cross's teaching about spiritual love. The young Karl Wojtyla had had a profound encounter with the writings of St. John of the Cross in 1941, the height of the Nazi persecution of the Polish church. And he'd gone on to write his doctoral dissertation on the subject of faith as the proximate means of union with God. In the spiritual canticle, St. John had described, the, had described spiritual marriage as the process whereby the beloved God is united with the soul, and the soul gives herself to God, keeping nothing back, or the process by which God and the soul each surrenders the entire possession of self to the other with a certain consummation of the union of love. Now in Love and Responsibility, the young Karol Wojtyla draws out the inverse of this. If spiritual marriage is the mutual gift of the Christian soul and God, then this mutual gift must be the essence of conjugal love itself in a way that is unique and not true of any other human relationship. The fundamental teaching of St. John of the Cross that spiritual marriage entails keeping nothing back is repeated throughout St. John Paul's writings on spousal love over the next 45 years. And in Familiaris Consortio, it becomes the foundation, the fundamental basis of the indissolubility of marriage. For there, in that document, he writes, the total self-giving would be a lie if it were not the sign and fruit of 
of a total personal self-giving in which the whole person, including the temporal dimension, is present. If the person were to withhold something or reserve the possibility of deciding otherwise in the future, by this very fact, he or she would not be giving totally. And again, in his letter to families, Gratissimum Sane, he writes, by its very nature, the gift of the person must be lasting and irrevocable. The indissolubility of marriage flows in the first place from the very essence of that gift. We spoke earlier of, of a dual insight in, in Gaudiumet's space, uh, uh, 24.3. The second aspect of that is the Council's teaching that man is the only creature on earth that God creates for itself. John Paul calls this the personalistic norm, and it is the foundation of his entire anthropology, of his concept of the dignity of every human individual, and of his conviction that persons can never be mere means. Between 1979 and 1984, St. John Paul developed these twin ideas in a remarkable series of 133 catechesis given at the Wednesday audience. Of course, it's impossible to do more than brush the surface uh, of, the, of these rich teachings in, in, in a short talk like this. But I'd like to highlight some of the key features of them, features which we, we might describe as the building blocks of St. John's, St. John Paul's doctrine of conjugal love. One of the key phrases that runs like a leitmotif throughout all of these catechesis, and indeed through all of St. John Paul's teachings on marriage, is the phrase, in the beginning, the phrase used by our Lord himself twice in his response to the Pharisees' questions about divorce, uh, and in which he sets forth his teaching about the indissolubility of marriage. The fact that our Lord takes us back behind the Mosaic law to the very law of creation itself is fundamental for St. John Paul, for it shows an intimate bond between the meaning of conjugal love and the very act of creation. For John Paul II, it is as male and female that God created man, and it is the, the very fact of the duality and complementarity of the two sexes that, man, that constitute man's being made in God's image. He spells this out repeatedly in the, in the catechesis, and in the 13th catechesis, makes it very explicit, and in, in a very physical way says, mankind, as man and woman, bears the divine image impressed on the body from the beginning. This understanding is expressed again in Familiaris Consortio, when he writes, God is love, and in himself he lives a mystery of personal loving communion. Creating the human race in his own image, God inscribed in the humanity of man and woman the vocation and the capacity of love and communion. As an incarnate spirit in his unified totality, love includes the human body, and the body is made a sharer in spiritual love. So contrary to the, to the view of those critics like Charles Curran, who accused John Paul of regarding passion and sexual pleasure as totally suspect and failing to acknowledge a fundamental goodness about sexuality, we can surely agree with Michael Wolstein when he says that John Paul's view of, of the sexual revolution is not that it overvalues sex, but, as Michael says, that it does not sufficiently appreciate the value and beauty of sex. It deprives sex of its depth by detaching it from the spousal meaning of the body. Indeed, one of John Paul's great concerns is to oppose the very Manichaean mentality which Charles Curran and others accuse him of. In the 45th Catechesis, he says this, while for the Manichaean mentality, the body and sexuality constitute, so to speak, an anti-value, for Christianity, on the contrary, they always remain a value not sufficiently appreciated. And John Paul's personalism, which underlies all of his teachings on conjugal love, sets his face clearly against what he sees as the neo-Manichaean tendencies of the post Descartes' Cartesian dualism of modern philosophy and modern anthropology. In his letter to families, Gratissimum Sane, he states this unequivocally. Man is a person in the unity of his body and spirit. The body can never be reduced to mere matter. It is a spiritualized body. Here for St. John Paul is the root of the fundamental error in modern, in modern secular thinking about sexuality. In 1957, 
he had opposed this dualism in love and responsibility, saying that we must not confuse the biological order with the order of nature, and diagnosing this error as the reason for modern man's inability, as he says, to understand the principles on which Catholic sexual morality is, is based. Later, St. John Paul was to perceive at the time of Blessed Paul VI's birth control commission that this was not an error to which the church herself was immune. As a member of that commission, but one who had been prevented by the Polish authorities from attending its final sessions, he was dismayed by the majority report which had embraced, as he saw it, the very Cartesian dualist principles to which he was so opposed. This could be seen in stark relief in that passage in the, in the majority report which approved of artificial contraception, stating that it was right because it was an example of modern scientific man's mastery over nature, something which it saw as being entirely in accordance with the will of God. Later in Evangelium Vitae, John Paul was to condemn this ideology, whereby, as he says, nature itself from being mata is now reduced to matter and is subject to every kind of manipulation. And he tells us that this philosophy means rejecting the very idea that there is a truth of creation which must be acknowledged or a plan of God for life which must be respected. The same teaching is proclaimed in Veritatis Splendor when he says that the modern secular view of sex treats the human body as a raw datum devoid of any meaning and moral values until freedom has shaped it in accordance with its design. Rather, he goes on, in Catholic teaching, the person, including the body, is completely entrusted to himself and is in the unity of body and spirit that the person is the subject of his own moral acts. We might pause at this point just to think about how prophetic was St. John Paul II's reaffirmation of this traditional Catholic teaching that man is a union of body and soul. For if the fault lines where the moral debate uh, was drawn in the 1960s was over the question of artificial contraception, the years which have followed have shown how insatiable is modern man's appetite to take control of nature, even if that is at the expense of God's plan for mankind. Artificial in vitro fertilization, genetic manipulation, embryonic experimentation, cloning, euthanasia, all of these things spring from what St. John Paul called an autonomous power of self-affirmation and from the error of regarding the human body as mere matter to be manipulated in whatever way we think best. In very recent years, the latest manifestation of this Cartesian mentality uh, it can be found in, in so-called transgender issues. Um, when you can read, as I did a few weeks ago in, in a British newspaper, that two English schools have now decided that children as young as six years old should be allowed to decide for themselves by what sex they are to be identified. You can see how that Cartesian mentality and, and false thinking has really taken, taken hold of the, of the root of, of the secular establishment. People who hold this view no longer think that man is a body, but rather that he has a body and may manipulate it with all the means at his disposal. For St. John Paul, by contrast, the body, male and female, is all important because of its spousal meaning, by virtue of which man is called to live like the Holy Trinity in whose image he is created, as a communion of persons. In its spousal meaning, moreover, the body enables man and woman to become the visible sign of Christ's love for the church. St. John Paul de dedicated no fewer than 15 of his Wednesday catechesis to the teaching of the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians that the, un that, that, that the mystery of marriage refers to the union of Christ with the church, something which St. John Paul repeatedly calls the great analogy. But as he develops his thinking, he, he shows that it's more than an analogy. It is rather a sacramental reality. So in Familiaris Consortio, he writes this, by virtue of the sacramentality of their marriage, spouses are bound to one another in the most profoundly indissoluble manner. Their belonging to each other is the real representation by sacramental sign of the very relationship of Christ with the church. <laughs> 
And indeed, in the very next section, he elevates marriage, which he refers to as the primordial sacrament, to a level which we would more, no, no, more, more normally associate with the Holy Eucharist, saying, spouses are the permanent reminder to the church of what happened on the cross. They are, for one another, witnesses to the salvation in which the sacrament makes them sharers. Of this salvation event, marriage, like every sacrament, is a memorial, actuation, and prophecy. I'd like to make a few observations now about the, the, the relevance uh, of St. John Paul's teachings on these issues to some of the things which have been discussed at the recent synod. Cardinal Casper, in his book, The Gospel of the Family, makes it clear that he regards the traditional teachings of the Catholic Church on human sexuality, and so by implication, St. John Paul's teachings, as inadequate to address the issues faced by modern man. He writes there of the then forthcoming synod, it would be a terrible disappointment if we would only repeat the answers that supposedly have always been given. Some courage and above all biblical candor are necessary. Well, it is my conviction that St. John Paul II showed all the courage and all the biblical candor that anybody could ever want. And that those answers that have always been given as formulated in his teachings were indeed sufficient to answer all of the needs of the church and of modern man, precisely because they are rooted in biblical truth and in St. John Paul's own life-affirming insights. The first thing to say about this is that St. John Paul anticipated all of the developments which have happened in terms of marriage breakdown and in terms of the non-compliance with Catholic sexual teaching, which have come in the 35 years since he wrote Familiaris Consortio. In that document, he warns time and again of the way that secular trends are leading, and he implores the priests of the church and the bishops of the church to lead their flock into the right ways and to save them from these false paths. Moreover, he was not blind, clearly, to the need to temper law with, with mercy. Again, when Cardinal Casper writes in Mercy, the Essence of the Gospel, that the topic of mercy appears always to have been relegated to the margins of the lexica and works of dogmatic theology. One wonders what he makes of the rich teachings of St. John Paul II about mercy. The Pope who canonized Sister Faustina, who instituted the Divine Mercy Sunday, and who dedicated a whole encyclical, Dives in Misericordia, to the subject, was hardly unaware of, of the issue. And we can be sure that all of the things he wrote about human sexuality were written in the light of a profound understanding of divine mercy. In fact, he expressly anticipates the suggestion that there is a conflict between the church's law and the law of mercy on these subjects in more than one place. First, he makes it clear that since the church's discipline in sexual matters is divinely given for man's own good, its strict application can never be equated with a lack of mercy. In Familiaris Consortio, he says, since the mortal order, I'm sorry, since the moral order reveals and sets forth the plan of God, the creator, for this very reason, it cannot be something that harms man. Secondly, he makes it clear that true mercy means teaching the truth of God's commandments, and that to introduce any doubt or ambiguity about these commandments is the very opposite of mercy. So in Familiaris Consortio, he says, to, to diminish in no way the saving teaching of Christ constitutes an eminent form of charity for souls. In Dives in Misericordia, he, in a beautiful passage which speaks of the inexhaustible mercy of God, he repeats that time-honored truth, which is going to be very important when we come to think about the question of divorce and remarriage, that God's mercy has only one limitation, he writes, no human sin can prevail over this power of divine mercy or even limit it. On the part of man, only a lack of goodwill can limit it, a lack of readiness to be converted and to repent. And finally, when he comes in Novo Millennio Inuente to many of the issues which have been discussed in the recent synod, he writes, these matters deeply torment our pastoral heart. But he says that those who live in irregular situations, irregular sexual unions, must approach the divine mercy by other ways, not, however, through the sacraments of penance and the Eucharist. 
So what does St. John Paul teach about some of these issues which have, have been most controversial in the world's press around the, the time of the recent synod, namely the church's attitude to those living in irregular unions, and particularly the divorced and remarried? The first thing to say about this is that everything that St. John Paul writes here must be seen against the background of his strong belief in the universal call to holiness. As George Weigel has shown in a recent article, one of the problems with the Cardinal Casper approach to mercy as he articulates it is that it can almost lead to two classes of Catholics, those who seek with all their hearts to observe the church's teachings as best they can on the one hand, and those who are unable to do so find themselves mercifully dispensed from doing so in one field or another. For John Paul II, this could never be the case. For him, he was utterly convinced that the universal call to holiness, the call to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, is a call to all of the baptized and a call which with God's grace and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, all of the baptized can realize. Novo Millennio Innuente focused particularly on this universal call, seeing it as the salvific hope of the new millennium. There St. John Paul tells us, that all pastoral initiatives must be set in relation to holiness and that we need to rediscover the full practical significance of Lumen Gentium dedicated to the universal call to holiness. Again, he is clear that this is a duty which concerns not only certain Christians, all the Christian faithful of whatever state or rank are called to the fullness of the Christian life and the perfection of charity. There can be no compromise for St. John Paul he tells us that the church's conviction is that baptism is the gateway to holiness through incorporation into Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and that this means it would be a contradiction to settle for a life of mediocrity. And he goes on to say that when we ask a catechumen, do you wish to be baptized, what we are really asking them is, do you wish to become holy? He repeats that perfection is possible for all, and not just for those whom he calls a few uncommon heroes. And he says in a beautiful and inspiring phrase, the time has come to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone this high standard of ordinary Christian living. Against this universal call to holiness, on the other hand, he set out a dire warning in many places to the church not to become infected with what he calls a loss of the sense of sin something which he clearly and prophetically saw as a threat to the church herself. The modern world, he says, in Novo Millennio Innuente, suffers from a deformation of conscience, a numbness or deadening of conscience, which leads to an obscuring of the sense of sin. And in the same document, he laments those pastors of the church who, out of a reaction against excesses, excess harshness in the past, have now started to teach what he calls a love of God that excludes any punishment due for sin. And he warns specifically against those theologians who raise serious questions of Christian morals in such a way as to diminish the true sense of sin, almost to the point of eliminating it altogether. The remedy which he proposes is clear. The restoration of a proper sense of sin is the first way of facing the grave spiritual crisis looming over man today. Well, I think we all have to ask ourselves in the light of these millennial exhortations of St. John Paul II, what have we done in the church to reduce this tendency to lose a sense of sin? It seems that all too often over the course of the recent synod, many of the statements that have been made have lacked reference to either the need to restore a sense of sin or indeed to the universal call to holiness. By contrast, St. John Paul applies these standards emphatically in Familiaris Consortio. I described Familiaris Consortio once before as almost the foundation charter of the ITI, and I think it should be the foundation charter of any discussions in the church about sexual relationships and conjugal love. And it's surprising, therefore, how relatively seldom it's actually quoted in some of the constitutional documents of the recent synod, and indeed, sometimes when it is quoted, it's quoted in a partial way with the more unpalatable passages omitted. I'll give a couple of examples of this. 
the instrumentum laboris of the second session of the Synod um, refers to those fathers who in the first extraordinary synod um, had favoured the readmission to Holy Communion of the divorced and the remarried. And it talks of a possible journey of reconciliation for the divorced and remarried, recommending that this journey should follow some of the steps set out in Familiaris Consortio. The uh, Relatio Finale makes similar, though somewhat toned down, uh, comments. Now, it's indeed true that, that Section 84 of Familiaris Consortio does set out a series of pastoral steps to be followed in order to make the divorced and the remarried feel less excluded from the church. But what both the Instrumentum Laboris and the Relatio Finale totally fail to mention is that the very same paragraph of Familiaris Consortio goes on to state unequivocally, the church reaffirms her practice, which is based on sacred scripture, of not admitting to Eucharistic communion divorced persons who have been remarried. They are unable to be readmitted thereto from the fact that their state and condition of life objectively contradict that union of love between Christ and the church, which is signified and affected by the Eucharist. And St. John Paul goes on to explain that reconciliation can only be granted to those who, repenting of having broken the sign of the covenant and fidelity to Christ, are sincerely ready to undertake a way of life that is no longer in contradiction to the indissolubility of marriage. This, of course, is precisely the point which John Paul was making in that passage we talked about earlier in Dives in Misericordia. God's mercy is inexhaustible, but it requires the cooperation of human repentance to be effective. Another example of familiaris consortia being quoted in a, a rather partial way by those who would seek to change the church's teachings uh, is when Cardinal Casper in the Gospel of the Family says that in Familiaris Consortio, St. John Paul II hinted at possible ways forward for the divorced and the remarried. The two examples of hints that he gives uh, are that there could be a wider application of um, annulments and that there could be a use of spiritual communion for the divorced and remarried. Now, it's actually quite hard to find these hints in Familiaris Consortio, but what is absolutely clear is that Familiaris Consortio does go on to make a very clear and concrete recommendation of a way forward for the divorced and the remarried, but Cardinal Casper doesn't mention it, and that is that those who have, following a divorce, formed a new union and cannot, for whatever reason, separate from it, should, quotes, take on the duty to live in complete continence that is, by abstaining from the acts proper to married couples. And here again, St. John Paul's confidence in the universal availability to the baptized of the means of grace is at the heart of this teaching. In Familiaris Consortio, he makes this clear when he says, to all of those who in our times consider it too difficult to be bound to one person for the whole of life, it is necessary to confirm the good news of the definitive nature of that conjugal love that has in Christ its foundation and strength. Given that St. John Paul had such a high doctrine of marriage, it comes as no surprise that his teachings exclude all other forms of sexual union. In Familiaris Consortio, he clearly states that marriage is the only place in which this self-giving in its whole truth is made possible. And he says it protects marriage, marriage protects freedom from every form of subjectivism or relativism. John Paul clearly anticipated and rejected any idea that other unions could have quasi-nuptial characteristics about them, or as the Relatio Posti Shepationum, the extraordinary synod would, would have it, contains seeds of the word which have spread beyond its visible and sacramental boundaries. This is why he specifically rejects gradualness if it means gradualness of the law. For as he says, in speaking of the need, to, uh, sorry, for as he says, the call to chastity is not merely an ideal to be achieved in the future, but is a concrete reality. When he speaks of other forms of union, what today we sometimes hear called euphemistically other lifestyles, he does not see them as an imperfect reflection of marriage, rather he sees them as inherently sinful. So in contrast to the Relatio Finale, which suggests that pastors should accept those living in irregular unions, accompany them on their journey, and as it says, 
remove our sandals before the sacred ground of the other, John Paul says, the aim of pastoral action will be to make these people understand the need for consistency between their choice of life and the faith they profess and try to do everything possible to induce them to regularize their situation in the light of Christian principle. To summarize, for St. John Paul II, conjugal love is something which was given in the very act of creation, which embodies and makes sacramentally present in the church the love of Christ for his church, as well as being the perfect image of the inner life of the Holy Trinity. It is therefore unique, no other relationship being, uniquely, being remotely comparable to it, and it is indissoluble of its very nature. He tells us in Gratissimum Sane that whilst showing maternal understanding for the many complex situations in which families are involved, the church is convinced that she must remain absolutely faithful to the truth about human love, otherwise she would betray herself. In these days when so much confusion has been sown amongst Christ's faithful, let us ask our new saint to pray for the church that she does not betray herself, but that she remains faithful to the rich teachings which are his legacy to us all. St. John Paul the Great, pray for us. Amen.